Shutter Island is a 2010 psychological thriller film set in the eerie Ashcliffe Asylum on a remote island. The movie begins with the arrival of the U.S. Marshal Teddy Daniels and his new partner to Shutter Island as they investigate the disappearance of an Ashcliffe patient. Ashcliffe Hospital is composed of three separate wards. Ward A, which houses the men, Ward B, which houses the women, and Ward C, which houses the facility's most dangerous patients. Typologically, Ward A and Ward B vary drastically from Ward C in both appearance and function. When analyzed through the lens of person-environment transactions, Ward A and B provide different degrees of support and autonomy from Ward C. A supportive or otherwise non-supportive environment is defined by the environmental press or stress and the reactivity level of staff and patients. The autonomy or non-autonomy of inhabitants is defined by the competency and the proactivity of staff and patients. Starting with the exterior of Ward A and B, they are small Gothic style buildings that are simultaneously modest yet ornamented, creating a welcoming and domestic character. Aesthetically, the ornamentation along the roof's fascia dignifies the building and makes it more personable. The large operable windows at eye level provide a high level of visual autonomy. Both of these factors create a supportive environment for its inhabitants. In the following film sample set in Ward A and B's surrounding gardens, we can identify multiple factors that contribute to a moderate level of support and autonomy. As you can see, patients are gardening. At the time, exposure to nature and physical labor was believed to be a therapeutic activity that would lead them to recovery. This would be considered a supportive environment. However, while they are doing physical work, the patients remain stationary. This is highlighted in the behavioral mapping of the scene. Indeed, they are all chained on both hands and almost each one is surveyed by an accompanying nurse or guard. These externally applied interventions that induce low autonomy in combination with the supportive environment produce a moderate level of support and autonomy. By contrast, Ward C takes the form of a large military fort. The architecture of the fortress itself is a symbol of power and control. Its surrounding walls with a singular entrance control and direct movement in and out of the building. The guards stationed along the top of the fortress further instill control through surveillance. The same effect is created by the watchtower. It functions as a panopticon, looming over the rest of the facility with an omnipresent gaze. The use of stone gives the ward an impermeable and unassailable stature, making the patients feel like there's no way out. Overall, the architecture imposes high environmental press to induce a high level of reactivity from the patients, that being submission to authority and a sense of powerlessness. In this film sample, we can see the second of two communal spaces within Ward A and B, the dining hall. Both the dining hall and the gardens are large spaces intended for patients to occupy communally. This scene involves the detectives interviewing patients as they continue their investigation of the missing patient. The open kitchen is in the dining hall maintains a degree of surveillance from the kitchen staff over the patients while they eat. It faces the tables and directs staff attention to the patients seated there. With the patient seating centered in the dining hall, there are at least two boundaries restricting patient movement as shown in the clip. The half height walls to the left of the tables and the servery to the front of the tables. Similar to the patient rooms in Ward A and B, patient movement in and out of the dining hall is direct and controlled by staff. This creates a moderate degree of environmental stress and provides patients with a low degree of autonomy. The condition of the dining hall appears to be clean, well-maintained, and well-lit, providing supportive and comfortable space. While occupant movement within the dining hall in Ward A and B is governed by staff, the shared nature of the space facilitates socialization among patients and therefore a greater degree of healthy stimulation than in solitary spaces. Ward C, however, is a devoid of communal spaces. In terms of interior patient units, there are actually very few scenes of patient quarters in Ward A and B, as patients seem to spend most of their time in communal or outdoor spaces. One of the few scenes involves the detectives investigating the missing patient's room. It is very perfunctory with only a bed and wardrobe as furniture. Though patients have their own room that they retreat to for privacy, there are still constant methods of surveillance and control. The doors are equipped with a small window, likely so staff can survey over patients from a distance. And although a large operable window and lampshade allow proper lighting, no light switch is to be seen. 
Likewise, there is no doorknob on the inner side of the patient's door, suggesting that the door can only be locked or opened from the outside. In this way, patient movement in and out of their room is only enabled by staff. These are important elements of autonomy that are stripped from the patient. Moving on to the patient units of Ward C, we witness how its design perpetuates the afflictions of custodial care and how the patient is treated as a dangerous inmate that must be contained. In the film sample we have chosen to analyze, Detective Teddy breaks into the restricted quarters of Ward C, where the more erratic and dangerous patients are held. After stumbling through dark hallways, Teddy is met with a double-loaded corridor with patient cells on each side. Though there are light fixtures and skylights along the ceiling, they are almost redundant as they either do not seem to work or the walls are actually too thick to allow light to penetrate. It is so dark that he needs to light a matchstick to see. The stack of light produces a lack of personal control, fear, and uncertainty about one's surroundings. As the camera takes on Teddy's perspective, we see that no wall separates each cell from the corridor, but rather floor-to-ceiling bars allow full view into the patient's cell. With many of the patients naked, this constant and complete lack of privacy induces a high level of environmental stress. There also seems to be a spatial hierarchy, with multiple patients sharing a cell earlier on and possibly more dangerous patients held in individual cells towards the back. The presence of multiple patients within one cell creates a constant source of stimulation, further adding to the degree of environmental stress. On the other hand, there is a complete lack of stimulation within the individual cells, which can induce a sense of helplessness. Likewise, although they all share a low degree of competence, each patient exhibits a different level of proactivity in response to Teddy's presence. Some patients are seen aggressively reaching towards him, whilst others show no reaction. This helplessness could be a result of prolonged conditions without autonomy. Looking at the condition of the cell, we can also identify a high level of discomfort. The only furniture they are given is a measly mattress placed on the wet, dirty, and likely cold stone floor. A short wall at the back of the room seems to hide a toilet. Clearly, the architecture of the unit provides all bare necessities to limit any unnecessary movements of the patient outside of their cell. In conclusion, the film sample selected from Shutter Island demonstrates significant contrast between the levels of support and autonomy in terms of person-environment transactions across wards. Ward A and B exhibit moderate levels of environmental press, reactivity, competence, and proactivity. Ward A and B's combination of a supportive environment characterized by domestic architecture and exposure to therapeutic nature with constant surveillance produces a moderate level of environmental press. Compelled to behave as a result of this constant supervision, patients in Ward A and B are moderately reactive. The patient's access to outdoor and communal areas, albeit dependence upon staff and physical restraints of chains combine to allow moderate competence. In such ways, while the patients do partake in physical activity beyond their cells, such as gardening and playing games, they often remain stationary and exhibit low energy, culminating into moderate proactivity. In contrast, Ward C shows high environmental press, high reactivity, low competence, low proactivity. The non-supportive environment characterized by a lack of privacy, poor conditions, and a mix of overstimulation and understimulation produces high environmental press. This induces very varying manifestations of high reactivity in the form of violent outbursts or complete indifference. Restricted to a cell with lack of control for movement and lighting, the patients have low competence. This also translates into low proactivity reinforced by prolonged periods without autonomy. Overall, while the architecture of Ward C reflects the tendencies to te treat psychiatric patients through dis custodial care, Ward A and B display the architectural movement of asylums towards therapeutic and recovery-focused environments. However, the institution's use of methods of surveillance and control are still omnipresent. Through filmetic analysis of person environment and transactions in Shutter Island, we have identified the significant advancements in psychiatric architecture across different wards. Most importantly, this analysis underlines the importance of continuing such studies on person environment transactions to improve mental health care facilities.